I was at All Out, guys, right? You know, I was out there just to be cheering for the return of Brian Danielson. Well, the, the debut of Brian Danielson in uh, AEW, but I didn't know what to expect from him in the ring, right? Because we hadn't seen Brian Danielson wrestle since 2012. We've seen Daniel Bryan plenty of times. But ever since SummerSlam 2012, when he returned to the WWE, we've seen Daniel Bryan, who's still a great wrestler. He's still put on five star matches in WWE. But we finally saw him debut in ring on Dynamite Grand Slam this week. And it wasn't Daniel Bryan we saw in the ring. No, 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 no. It was Bryan Daniels. And it looked like he had, he had not lost a step. He was in there against um, the greatest wrestler on the planet, or one of the top three at least, in Kenny Omega. And what a, to what a story they told this week. People are calling it a classic. I can't call it a classic because it's only two days, three days old. Right. I mean, we don't we don't know if it's a classic yet, but it was certainly a fantastic match, and and it's amazing to me that uh, for the second time in two and a half weeks, you know, we have people going all over the social all over social media about how AEW's put on the match of the year. You know, we had the cage match, and then we had this match, two times in you know less than three weeks. So that's pretty awesome. Um, but I, I really like the story of that match. I really liked how, um, you know, the, Danielson wanted to wrestle the best in the world, and Kenny Omega was proving to him pretty much the entire match that he was the best in the world. So, right. um, I, I thought it was a great way to kick off pro wrestling or kick off a Dynamite Grand Slam this week, kick off Grand Slam in general. And I don't know about you, Jeff, but I thought both shows were just absolutely fantastic. And well, well what I was able to see yeah. of both shows. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You, have, you, have, you haven't seen Rampage, uh, Rampage yet. That's right. Um, I've got the last half hour of it. Welcome to Kingdom of Honor. Um, I am your host, Dan Manchin and Sabrina, along with my good buddy, the Honorable Jeff. Um, you, you said you saw about half an hour. You have about half an hour to go, right? Yeah, so I've got the Lights Out match and um, the Bunny or the Penelope Ford uh, and a J match left to go. Okay, so so let's just, I always want to get this out of the way real quick because I have a couple of nitpicks with Rampage. Nothing for Dynamite, but Rampage had a couple of nitpicks with it, so I just wanted to get those out of the way real quick. Um, first of all, the commentary was terrible. <laughs> but, yeah, which is um, weird because when I've seen Taz, Excalibur, and Ricky Stark on Dark, they've been phenomenal. They were just bad. They, in that CM Punk match alone, Taz... Uh, CM Punk went up to the top rope to deliver the Macho Man elbow. He even did the whole fingers up, pointing to the sky and all that stuff right before he did it. And Taz is screaming, what the hell are you pointing at? I know. It was it just an elbow. Close. And it was like, I was like, Taz, how did you miss that that was the Macho Man elbow that he was doing? I mean, I knew see, it was the second he put it in the air. Yeah, well, see, and I, and I remember like that used to be one of his trademark moves, right? He would either hit the, the knee strike in the corner and the clothesline or the district in the corner that are running bulldog, the next move would be the elbow drop from the top rope. And yeah. and I and I remember being surprised at all out when he hit that when he hit that clothesline, when he but he just go, went for a pin right away. He did not go for the, the top rope elbow. I was like, okay, right. well maybe maybe he's just not gonna apply for the top rope anymore, right? And but he but he did do it last night. I thought that was I thought that was really cool. Um but yeah, the other when, uh, the other issue really I had good. with that match. The other issue I had with that match is um, when Punk put on the sleeper hold and he called it a rear naked choke. That yeah. was, you know, that those were the two things that Taz did during that match that just, it just really bothered me. But just in general, like, like Starks and Taz, every time he feels you're not going, oh yeah, that's my friend. It was getting, it was getting, it got very super irritating. It was like. Okay, you don't need to say it every time. We get it. You're fucking heels. They're heels. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> right. Know? 
And, and, the rather, thing, and, 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 and but then we bet President of American Top Team makes absolutely no fucking sense because that totally destroys the the whole thing about Dan Lambert beating everybody in WWE. Or I'm sorry, everybody in AEW except for right. um, Sky and Paige. Yeah, you know, so man of the year. Yeah. The, the other uh, thing um, too that, the, the, but, but the the other nitpicks, the other nitpicks I had that, I know, I know, were, you know, why does Orange Cassidy's music hitting and hitting the running punch, the uh, orange punch on, um, who thought he hit it on uh, Jack Evans? Jack Evans. Um, make Matt Hardy stop cutting Ortiz's hair. <laughs> And, uh, and, and uh, yeah, then, like, the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll get tonight, and then I'll let you talk. So, sorry, I just wanted to, the, the, I just wanted to list them out before I forgot. Um, but and speaking of the American Top Team, if the rest of Inner Circle were there, and especially if they were you know, like, Pride and Powerpoint a match right after the match, why the fuck weren't they, weren't they out there trying to help their teammates? Sorry. Okay, I'm gonna comment on that last um, because okay. I read something. I read something um, from Jericho earlier this week that kind of explains what's going on with the Inner Circle and Pinnacle. Um, first of all, Taz was off his game. Ricky Starks was just absolutely horrendous. And like I said, I've listened to that uh, that commentating trio multiple times on Dark and absolutely loved them. They sounded like they're having fun. They're laughing. They're making fun of Ricky Starks. This time, it was just, I, I don't know what the problem was, but they were just off. They were not they were not cohesive. None of the three of them were working well together. Um, Ricky would just throw in some stupid comment that made absolutely no sense, and then Taz would go, oh, you know, I hate cliches, and then Taz would follow it up with a cliche. Um, it, it, it was just horrendous. That was the only real negative I, I had on what I've seen. Um, I think Private Party, considering where they were two years ago, is really getting lost in the shuffle now that they're part of the Hardy family office. They just don't seem to have it anymore. They don't have that drawing power that they had a couple of years ago. Like I understand Blade and Butcher being part of it. I understand H2 or hybrid two or whatever being part of it, but private party needed to stand on their own. They and they were, were, well, they, were the, they were the first, they were the first to ever do the game Yeah, and, but I, they just, they seem like they're lost in tag team shuffle hell right now because they're part of the Ham, Hardy family office and they were fine on their own. So I don't, I don't get it. Um, and then the whole inner circle thing, I read something earlier where earlier in the year that um, the match where the inner circle was going to disband, that was a stadium stampede match, right? Or was that the one after it, the war games, whatever, whatever match it was when they were supposed to disband, that was actually Jericho's idea and Jericho wanted to disband the inner circle. Okay. He wanted them, he wanted them to go their separate ways and Tony Khan talked him out of it and told him that why disband something that's great you guys can still be a group and doing your own things. So right okay. now they're all doing their own things. But like you said, I don't understand. They're still a group. So where was Sammy? Sammy was in the building. He came out two segments later to flash some signs. You know, uh, and he, and, like you and said, what, Santana. And, 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 what, and, what, and what did his best say on? Inner Circle. Inner Circle original. Yep. So yeah. it's like. It, it just, it made no sense to me why they didn't come down. I thought that too. But then it, I read that article or article about uh, Jericho and Khan earlier this year talking about breaking them up. So it kind of makes a little more sense that they're going their own way now, but there's still a group. But we've seen that now with the Pinnacle too. It looks like the Pinnacle is kind of going their separate way. You, I think you mentioned it. It's like it's MGF and Wardlow on one side doing their thing. And then it's... Uh, um, FTR and Sean Spears and Tully doing something else. And I'm perfectly fine with that. I mean, I'm perfectly fine if that's the case. If they're, they're going to be separate from each other, um, I prefer that. I, but you know, if they're if they're not going to push the inner circle, I mean, not the inner circle, but uh, the pinnacle as like a four horseman type group, I'd be, I'm, I'm, I'd rather the that MGF just be on his own with Wardlow. 
you know, and right. and totally and totally match your ethnicity. That's that's perfectly fine. But my thing is that the inner circle is still together, and we saw that all out that they were right. They all came down to support yeah. Jericho. They had that big moment yep. at the end where they're all singing together. Um, they they should be you know together, and and I mean it's probably something as simple as maybe they should have switched some matches, there, right? You know, they they right. put. And they put the eight man tag on. It's hard to it's hard for me to, to like want to change anything for Dynamite. Dynamite is such an awesome show, but it, right. maybe they just they just switch those two things around that it, there wouldn't be as quite as much of a disconnect. You know, it's just, it's just so odd that like Jericho and and uh, Swag and uh, Hager were getting beat down. They go to commercial, come back, and Todd Hall is It's like, right. well, you know, if you were there, why didn't you help out your partner? <laughs> Why didn't you help? Why didn't you help out your boss? Your boss is getting beat down, right? And you're just standing in back watching it. I mean, they came, they rushed to the rescue of Penta and uh, Ray, but they couldn't rush to the rescue of uh, their teammates. Exactly. You know, so yeah, I get that. It, it, it didn't make much sense to me either. Why? Why it happened? I was the whole time I was waiting for at least, even at least Sammy to come running out, but nothing. Nobody came out. No. So yeah, but a uh, dynamite. It, the match quality was fantastic. Like every match that I saw was fantastic all throughout this week. And I watched some other matches too that I'm sure we'll end up talking about here soon that weren't AEW. But I thought dynamite. Every match was a was a banger. Um, I thought the three that I've seen or that I saw so far on Rampage were fantastic. Um, the it was a weird mix of. Like I'm not going to call it a uh, you know a classic that came out of the Christian Cage, or I'm sorry, not Christian Cage, uh, CM Punk, Powerhouse Hobbs. It seemed like there was a weird chemistry disconnect between those two, but I still th- thought it was a fantastic match, and that triple threat match or that uh, um, trios match with uh, Christian Luchasaurus and uh, Jungle Boy against uh, Super Elite or Super Click, I thought was fantastic that match was just great just great yeah Every it, it was it. yeah absolutely and yeah i mean and and like you know my, my wife is my wife was sitting here um where i'm sitting right now and i was sitting in the recliner behind me when uh when that match was going on and and she was like she was like looking at her phone and, and the jackson started running the ropes and i was like honey you're gonna miss the best part of you're gonna miss the, the best move in wrestling <laughs> right because <laughs> you know i mean um as critical as I've been on Adam Cole on this show, it you know when he's with the Super Click, I'm just in I'm just in heaven, you know, because I remember their time, their time all the time in Ring of Honor and New Japan. We saw them together, and how fantastic those trios matches always were when those guys were together. Mm-hmm. And and I and, yeah, and, and I, she, as, and she, as she looked up just in time to see to see them kiss Adam Cole on the cheek, and uh, and, uh, and she's like she's like yeah, he's so beautiful. <laughs> kind of well, funny. the <laughs> the I, the first time I saw them was in their PWG match, yeah. Um, and I can't even remember who it was against, but it was Matt Nick and and Adam Cole, uh, and that match was just fantastic. Probably one of the best trios matches I think I've ever seen. Uh, and then everything they did after that was just amazing. They had that one match on Ring of Honor that still ranks as one of my all time favorites um, for the six man or the the trios title. Whatever they're yeah, called, six, whatever they call it. It's a six man title. Six, You're right. Okay. Yeah. And they, I mean, they, they just deliver. And I, you're right. I, I didn't even realize it when I mentioned it before, but they took the boom from, uh, um, from his, um, from the UE theme and made an entire song about it and then named his, named the last shot uh, or the last the, call, the or last shot, whatever it is. The boom now. It, yeah. They, I, I love what AEW does. I just absolutely love everything they do. They take the smallest little bit that they can find and turn it into a huge gimmick because it was something that got over uh, with wherever they were before. That's funny you mentioned that because because when you uh, when you uh, texted me that you were having trouble with your computer this morning, I like looked on Spotify for that song and I was like actually like grooving out to that song for a little bit while I was waiting for oh, yeah. you. To, to come. <laughs> yeah, it's a good Yeah, that's yeah, really my... great. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know the other thing we talked about this week was uh, talked about this week. You know, was, was a theme song was, was like Brian the Brian Danielson thing about you know the flight of the Valkyries 
or you know the ride of the Valkyries, if you want to call it by the wrong name. But the fight of the Valkyrie, um, Valkyries is uh, was you know was this WWE theme. Um, they tried to get Final Countdown, his old independent and Ring of Honor theme. Um, you know, the crowd really used to always sing along to with him. And, you know, Europe wanted an exorbitant, fucking ridiculous amount for it, which was just retarded of them. Um, only, and to use it about half the time that he'd be needing it. What he said, a total of 20 times a year. And you figure, like, you know, if you, if you like, do a run-in, your music's going to play. You know, if you, then when you come up for your match, your music's going to play. So, I mean, they could, you know, that, that would waste two out of those 20 times on one episode. And then if you win, you know? if you win the match, then your music plays. So yep, you'd, you'd, you you'd have three times. You'd have three times that, you know, or you come out for an interview, your music's going to play. But I read somewhere, too, that Daniel Bryson hated that song, and the only reason he used it on the indies was as a joke. No, they tried to get it. Um, but it's, but it's I, wish I, I wish my stupid Google would work, because I would love to look up that article I read. But they, there was, I remember reading somewhere that Daniel Bryson, or Brian Danielson, hated that song. And he used it simply as a joke, kind of like um, uh, Tony Deppen does in GCW with uh, with Starship. And we built we this built city. This city. Yeah. I mean, Tony, Depp, oh, Tony Deppen's yeah. using that as a joke. And that's kind of what I heard Daniel Bryanson did. Or Jesus. Brian, Brian Daniel. Daniel. It's going to um, take me a decade uh, yeah. to figure that out. Yeah. You know, Daniel Bryanson may very well lose that song, but Brian Danielson apparently, you know, apparently really wanted it. So, oh, I, yeah, uh, I guess I don't know. Uh, I, I but, but, really but, wish but my he, Google would work so I could look it up. But 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 he but that ended up with him asking. I think I think he said the, the name of his friend was Mike Elliott or something to to write you know to write a song for him. So basically, they're, they started out with like Valkyries, then it leads into this brand new theme song. So you know they're they're really killing it that way too. I I um, yeah I don't know. Do we do we want to do we want do we want to backtrack and go to you know, start like start a dynamite and then move over to Ramage, or where, where do you want to go? I, I, dude, we're just having a conversation. We'll go all over the place. Um, but my, uh, I, I think, and it's it's weird, but I'm trying to think. I know we were down a little bit on, um, on AW earlier in the year because so much stuff was happening on Dark and Elevation, and then it would just show up with no story, on on Dynamite. But I think. Somewhere around, I want to say June-ish, when uh, Malachi Black debuted, and, and probably right before that, ever since that moment, this company cannot do anything wrong. No. It, it, it's it's mind-boggling. They literally, from theme music to interview time to the way they're managing talent, um, even with the roster that they've got, they still manage their talent amazingly well. The only negative that I could add, say even slightly is I still have issues with the um, with the way that title matches are handed out. It doesn't seem I know they've got this whole ranking system and all, but um, it doesn't seem like they are really doing it well um, because Butcher comes back after uh, what? How long? six months off and all of a sudden blade and butcher are the number one contenders yeah but they were also defeated this year right but you know they and then it was the same thing now sammy guevara last time sammy guevara wrestled in AEW, he wasn't even on um on double or nothing or in all or on all out and i think the last time he wrestled was like three months ago he shows up on TV to talk about his best friend, uh, Fuego del Sol, and he comes out and does his little sign gimmick during the picture-in-picture um, -picture stuff. But he hasn't done anything in months. And now all of a sudden he gets a TV title shot? That's my well, only negative about, about AEW well, right now. Everything well, else they're doing is just... I, I don't think the TNT title really factors into the rankings, though. I mean... The, because, because if we look at it, like, you know, Fuego Del Sol got a TV, got a TNT title match. He was like one in twenty-seven, you know, and and that's how like Ricky Starks and Eddie Kingston came into the company was getting shots at the TNT title, right? So, um, I don't think the TNT title. I think the TNT, the TNT title is meant to be more of like a 
you know, open challenge type of belt where anybody in the world can challenge for it. I think that's what Cody said when it was first instituted. So I don't have okay. a problem at all with people getting shots at that belt. But yeah, Sammy Guevara, I, I would love for it to have been more like, um, you know, him, him having like an actual build towards this this match, right? Because the last time we saw him actually wrestle was against Sean Spears in that um, street fight type match in Houston. And then he, and then he, um, and then, you know, that's the show that he also proposed to his wife, I mean, his fiance now, Pam, you know, before right. that show started. So, I mean, and that was, so that was probably, I don't know, I don't think it was three months ago, but I think it was probably like, you know, the middle of August at least, right? It was, it was two, two and a half months ago, yeah. It was a while ago. And it's just, and before that, he had that match against MJF. Um, and before that was the um, stadium stampede match. So, or no, it was the blood and guts match. It was a blood and guts match first, or was a stadium stampede match first? Stadium stampede match was was the was the uh, finale of that. For that uh, okay, so he, good. He, oh, that's right. Yeah, because the blood and guts match is where he threw him off the stage, and that led to the stadium stampede. Okay. Right. Yeah. So I mean, we talked before about how how can a guy get over like MJF does without um, being in the ring? Well, MJF is out there talking at least every episode. You know, you Sammy is just nowhere to be found, and it, it's I don't want to it, say it was, they're misusing. It was uh, it was August eighteenth that match that I was talking. About. I don't want to say first. they're misusing them at all because, like I said, I, I feel like they they do a great job. AEW does a great job of, of keeping everybody relevant, and you don't even have to watch Dark and Elevation anymore to see the relevancy of these people. Um. You know, they they come out, they like Dante Martin, he had that fantastic match. He hasn't been on since. And it's got me just, the next time I see Dante Martin on screen, I'm going to be all giddy for it because I'm just waiting for another performance like that. Oh, it'll be Wednesday. Yeah. So, you know, and, and that's, it, it's a perfect layout. It's like, he's not there every single week. So you're not getting sick of him. Like Darby Allen wasn't even on um, Rampage at all, was he? No, he was on Dynamite. Right, he was on Dynamite, but not on Rampage. They're doing. They didn't even mention him. Same thing with MJF. Didn't even mention him on on Rampage. They're doing a really good job of not overexposing people. I guess yeah, they is what are I'm getting at. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know if you, I don't know if you got to the part in Rampage where they announced matches for uh, next week's Dynamite yet, but no. uh, but they've got. Uh, but it, it's a uh, Cody and Lee Johnson against Dante Martin and Matt Seidel. And um, they've also announced a one-on-one -on -one match between Jungle Boy and Adam Cole, baby. Yep, exactly. Sweet. So, yeah. So, the, so they got some good stuff set up for. I don't want to tell you what the. I don't want to tell you what the other matches they announced because because it, it'll it kind of plays into um, the rest of the night. Kind of yeah. What are the what are the matches that are you you still have to go? Well, and and, and another, another thing happens that happens later in the night that I. I also don't want to don't want to mention you know something I really want to see and, and why it's not possible. So, I'm well, kind of and you know the hair the hair versus hair match um, that is now between Jack Evans and Orange Cassidy uh, is kind of I, I I'm really not liking this hair versus hair this hair gimmick that's going on between Orange Cassidy and Matt Hardy. It, I, it's just an annoying little feud that is kind of bothering me a little bit, but. No, I, you know, actually, I actually heard this week, speaking of that, that uh, Thunder Rosa proposed having a hair versus hair match between her and Britt Baker. Really? Yeah. That'd be interesting. It would be interesting. You know, that I think the only time I can remember it, I'm sure it's happened in Mexico before, but the only time I can remember there being a hair versus hair match um, for women's wrestling was when it was uh, Molly Holly against uh, was Victoria, right? Yeah, and Molly lost that, didn't she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Molly lost it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I I don't. I mean, the the slight little negatives that I have really cannot outweigh what they're doing. I can't question anything Tony Khan does. It, it, he is running this company perfectly. I I just think they're hitting on all cylinders. Um, they it, you know, and everything, no matter how great it is, is always going to have that slight negative. Um. 
but it's well, such a small negative that I can't even complain about. Well, you know, just just you know, thinking about, and this is maybe like a like a good way to quantify it is, you know, there have been times there have been times where like you know, there's a Ring of Honor pay per view on a Friday night and it starts at eight o'clock our time, goes to like eleven eleven thirty and. And you know, like I'll and I'll like, I'll like tell you like, the next morning why I fell asleep, like you know, with like an hour to go in the show or half an hour to go in right. the show. Or I or I'll, like we'll talk about like you know, I'm watching some JPW and I doze off like at like you know, ten thirty, eleven o'clock at night. Last night I was wired all the way through you know, and 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 you know, Rampage went for you know, started nine o'clock our time, went to eleven o'clock our time. I you know, I had I was not tired at all. You know, I was sitting there watching that thing and it just just like I'm not quite as much as on Dynamite, but it, it basically just feels well to get food through that show, you know. See, and, and it's it, you know, you know, it's and, tough and, for and, me to... and on Dynamite, you know, on Dynamite, like you know, we talked about we were like you and know, I were, were were texting back and forth about it, and I even tweeted out like, "Wait, how is it already made of that?" <laughs> you right. know? So. Well, it, it, the the problem with me and Rampage is especially on a Friday night when I have my son, which I'm sure you can probably hear here in the background counting, um, is that it's Friday night and my son's here. Um, and so usually I'll watch Rampage in the morning before we do our show on Saturdays. But um, a two-hour show, I just couldn't get in this morning. That's just a lot of wrestling, a lot of wrestling, but it's, it was everything I've seen was worth it. I mean, Hey, let's start with the, you know, the Kenny Omega, uh, Brian Danielson match. Ooh, I did it right. Um, <laughs> I saw that Meltzer gave that a five star, which what? absolutely. Yeah. What? You only gave it five. It, I don't it, maybe five plus, I guess. I don't know, but it was, they said that that was the first five-star match that he's ever given uh, Brian Danielson. Really? Yeah. Which I find odd when you look at how great he is. I'm looking, I'm looking at the star rating right now. Yeah, you're right. It was a five-star. How did he only give that match five stars? Probably because it was a TV match. It was a TV match, but it like it, it like one very brief commercial interruption, and it was all on picture and picture, picture and picture, yeah. And 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 if one of the things, and, and you know, one of the you had that debate with him earlier this year, right, about about right. his ratings, and when he, yeah, he said so one I, of the and, and he said one of the things that he that he that he includes is the way the crowd is reacting. The crowd was fucking on fire that entire match. How could that not yeah have, have pushed an extra star itself? You know, I I don't well he. It. Now that I understand his rating methods, I'm not, you know, I still look at him as he, he knows his stuff. He, he absolutely knows his stuff. And I look at his reporting that way. Um, the matches that he does grade highly are usually highly rated matches. My, my problem was that there's certain matches that I didn't think he gave five stars to that he should have, but that's my opinion. You know, that's the opinion based part of it. And then when I, figured out what his formula was because he finally told me what goes into his ratings it's not it's not opinion it's not feelings it's based on a formula um and that's no, where I, I, no i i do get that but my 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 thing about that is like for instance if you if you think about like okada versus omega not not their not their final two not their final two matches but their first one. that's right. the first one he, that, that's when he gave six stars to you huh yep that omega, was the one that broke that, the system yeah, the Omega versus Okada main event Wrestle Kingdom went 47 minutes. Um, was that match really better than the match we saw this this past week? I, to be honest, I felt like this match was better because my biggest complaint about the that first Okada um, and Omega match was there wasn't enough time in between big moves. Like there'd be a big move and there was no rest. There was no, ouch, I'm in pain. It was just somebody jumping up, almost like no-selling it within seconds and moving on to the next the next move. Where in this match, I felt like that time was there. Like they, they were um, not trying to rush to get to the next high spot. They were letting the story breathe. And that was, you know, my only complaint about that first Omega Okada match is I didn't, I felt like they were rushing the story just to get to the next spot. And I also felt like this match had more of a story to it in the sense that, 
you know, we know the history of Brian Danielson's neck. Right. And we and, and and the way that Omega kept targeting it, you know, we all we all were kind of like gasping, like you know, especially like that, you know, especially like the running knee strikes on the outside or the dragon suplex on the top rope. Like, oh my God, is Danielson going to be able to handle this? <laughs> you know, I I, I felt like I felt like that psychology in that match was so much. As much as I love that Omega versus Okada match, and I do, um, I thought this match like had this better, you know psychology i mean just because it didn't take didn't take place in japan does not mean it wasn't a six-star match if you're going to use this if you're gonna have no. seven stars on your scale you know what i mean so it, it it's probably part of his formula and i want to say this we're going to get to it a little bit later on but i want to say it now how speaking of next how the hell is effie still alive <laughs> did you, you know what i'm talking about that monkey flip that he landed directly on his head yeah, yeah, well, um, I, I I think he, he probably just had like a rainbow like blocking that blocking his neck from broken. Is that what it was? Because I <laughs> when he hit <laughs> when he hit the mat, I thought he was dead. Seriously, especially considering yeah. he didn't move for like ten seconds. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll get to that in a second. But back to this, I think yeah yeah the reason yeah well, why was, yeah, was almost, yeah, it was almost like a monkey flip driver. He took it. <laughs> that was insane. Like that that might have been the most insane thing I've ever seen. Um, but, you know, back to the rating, I, knowing that what Meltzer's formula is, I think the reason why it didn't go above is because of a commercial break, even though it was picture in picture, um, and also because it was a TV match. Uh, I think that, you know, I, I just not, I don't know for sure, but I have a feeling that that's the kind of stuff that rates into his formula. You know, we really need to stop thinking about things in terms of, um, just, because the, just because the way the business has changed, Jeff, we really need to stop thinking in terms of, TV match versus pay per view match, and the reason Especially I say with that, AEW, the reason I, and the reason I say that is, you know, AEW. Um, I don't know. I know. I don't. I don't know what the rights fees are with TNT, right? But but I, what I what I do know is that they earned about five million dollars from All Out, and, and a, that's the most successful event of all time, right? Meanwhile, WWE is two hundred eighty nine million dollars a year. From from you know from Fox for Smack, so I mean when, right. when you think when you think about it that way, and ha- think about how much ratings play into things, how much ratings play into rights fees for these TV shows, how much you know TNT was ba- basically begging you know Tony to come up with a third hour of wrestling, um, for the week, and I'm sure that they're going to push him to do more going forward. Um, we got to you know we. We just can't think of it in those terms. Even though we're not, we're wrestling fans, we're not business people, you know, we, we can't really think of it in those terms because they, they can't think of it in those terms. You know, they've got to no, put together and, the, best, the, best, the best possible matches on their shows to, you know, to keep driving people to watch their product. And AAW has proven that. There's no difference between a pay-per-view and a weekly show. Um, right. And that, I mean, that was one of my issues early on was that the pay-per-views just felt like a regular dynamite. And there really is no difference between a dynamite and a pay per view, um, except the pay per view is where the stories end. So you have to watch the pay per views to see the stories end. Um, but it, <clears throat> all in all, they're just, it's fantastic TV every week, all three hours of it. Uh, if you get a chance to watch Dark and Elevation, they do some fantastic stuff on that too. I just don't always have the time but it looks like they've shortened dark and elevation to hour-long shows now they have the problem is right now is through, through g1 time too so there's time i'm right. really watching that um sure. and then and then we also have the problem this week that you know flew under our radar jeff but mlw returned this week to, on with it with fusion yep. alpha on wednesday and i haven't, yep. I haven't had a chance to watch that yet but i saw that we get fucking davy richards versus tjp to start off with. so i mean it's like yeah you know <laughs> where do I find the time to fit that in? But I'm, go- I'm going to. Well, like, you know, time? and it's like you know? my my rankings right now on TV or on you know on wrestling is at the top, of course, AEW. Uh, GCW is second for me right now because they're another company that just is not missing at all. Everything they're doing is fantastic. Then, of course, NJPW because that's just great wrestling. MLW. Um, right now for me is sitting at fourth uh and it's kind of a toss-up between fifth whether on my mood ring of honor or impact you know they're they're 
five and six. Just depends on the week, I guess, for their order. And when you say NJPW, of course, you mean new junior pro wrestling. What? When you say NJPW, you mean new junior pro wrestling. As new in junior pro wrestling? As in, as in uh, ZSJ. Yeah, yeah exactly. Holy <laughs> crap. Uh, but even, I mean, even there, uh, you know, they've got two great shows too. They've got everything that's happening in Japan and then Strong with Osprey and White on it. And it, it's just, it's so much wrestling to watch, but it's so amazing. Yeah, it's just, of, it's a great, great time to be a wrestling fan. Speaking of Strong and Jay White, I read this morning that last night's show, I didn't, um, had Jay White versus Peter Eagle. Really? Yeah. Okay, I guess what I'm watching as soon as I'm done with this. <laughs> 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 I, you know, another thing too, um, is I've been back into BTE this last few weeks. Um, simply because I heard there was a kind of a lead up one to all out where they resurrected, um, Adam Cole. So I watched that. Yeah. You heard that from me. And then I watched, so I watched that one. Then of course I watched the, you know, the next two. And yesterday I sent you that one, um, that I'm not kidding. That first 10 minutes or five minutes of that was some of the funniest shit I've ever seen in my life with the, uh, you know, Kenny Omega's paranoia and them catching up with Adam Cole and, trying to explain yeah. to them that they're not the bad guys and it's not their fault. Adam Page is not a part of the elite anymore. And Cody and him. I, it's just, yeah, I, mean, I haven't seen it yet, but I, I saw you send it to me, but I, I think I'm, yeah, I think this is, I think the most recent one is the only one. Cause I'm trying to get so much wrestling, wrestling. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. yeah it's, it's lucky that it's, it's good that it's only like a 15 minute thing so I can watch on a break or something. Yeah. Um, but it, it, even BTE is just fantastic as well. Like the the whole stuff I just love Jonathan Silver when Anna's around when Anna Jay's around um because he you'll and you'll see it in this one he's just so annoying and she's doing everything she can to not crack up while he's yelling in her ear Anna 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 I really like Sour Boy that, that cracks me up every time what's that Sour Boy that there. cracks me up oh yep yeah, Sour Boy cracks me up. And it's giving me a new appreciation for 2.0. I mean, not only am I really digging their in-ring work, their, their name sucks. We know that. But their in-ring work, especially Matt Lee, is fantastic. Um, and then watching them and their personality on BTE is great as well. Just great as well. They were On this episode, you're going to see it. They were digging through Wheeler Yuta's bag, trying to find out... Um, what his enhancer is because his hair is jet black. It you know, Matt Lee, Matt, Matt, Matt Lee, you know, I, and I mean this as a compliment for those who don't, you know, I'm, I'm sure there'd be people out there that don't like Bully Ray, but I think Bully Ray was a, was great at getting like just a heat magnet. And when I, oh, when, yeah. I when I look at what Matt Lee does every time he gets in the ring, I he reminds me so much of Bully Ray. You know, you know, he, he'll, 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 he'll go out there, you know, he'll, 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 he'll get the crowd like, like pissing him off, you know, he's, he'll get the crowd all pissed off, do a couple of things, and tag tag out to park. See, and I was going to say, doing it, I, I just think he does such a, the little those little heat grabbing things so well, you know. And see, I was going to compare him to RSP. Yeah, because his in, his in ring heel work is so good. Yeah. He's just he's good at his actions of getting the crowd angry. He's not yelling at the crowd like uh, Bully Ray does. He's not you know, talking down to the crowd like Brian Johnson does or MJF does, but he has that in-ring ability to piss a crowd off and and be a heel without actually using his words. Um, I think right. he does a fantastic job. And if I were to compare him to anybody, it'd be uh, Ricky Shane Page as far as that goes. That makes sense. Yeah. Because Ricky, Ricky's the same way. He's just got some innate ability in his actions to piss the crowd off and that's i see that same thing with matt lee but matt lee yeah. i'm getting i'm i'm really but, happy but you, you know you don't you know what you don't you know what you don't want to do with, with against matt lee is you don't want to play blackjack you don't want to play blackjack and you don't want to play bottles um bottle yeah. bottle pool or whatever um but they uh the the stuff that i i'm just loving 
everything like 2.0 when they came on board at first i was like why are these guys getting pushed daniel garcia and 2.0 why are they getting pushed so hard why are they because they're fucking good and <laughs> tony knows what he's doing it's like after i saw the way you know they first debuted the same thing with the uh, um with the nightmare factory uh you know with um i can't think of his name uh qt marshall and yeah you know, everything yeah. when, when it first happened i questioned it but it turned to gold you know and that's what's happening right now with daniel garcia and uh 2.0 is it's turning to gold even though i question it at this point i'm never going to question tony again because he knows what he's doing and the fact that he took a 25 million dollar loan from his dad and two years later turned it into this i'm going to start taking financial advice from that dude too because that's just amazing <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know. I think I think it's so funny. I, I, I and I'll be, I don't know if you heard this, Jeff, or not, but uh, but I and I I guess I heard this like last week or the week before, maybe on Busted Open. But basically, like when he was, he would like do, do like you know the uh, evolve. What do you call it? Anyway, the the EVR, whatever that was called, the the, you know, the wrestling emulator type thing. Oh yeah. And he would he would, like he would, like you know make like make his own promotion. And, you know, and, and, you know, the, his ferocious TV show was dynamite. And then like he was, booking, then he was booking cards and he was booking and he was booking so many matches. He had to make a second show and that one was Rampage. <laughs> and, so, right. and so, you know, AEW, you know, their first two shows are basically the shows that he had. And he kind of had the same thing happen where he always booking so many, he had so much talent booking so many things. He had to have a second show. <laughs> so, right. So, so it all you know, kind of worked out in real, real life the way that it worked out when he was emulating wrestling in his uh, GM in his GM app, whatever that was. That's great. That's fantastic. Well, he, uh, I don't know. I, I can't say enough good things about AEW right now. I just really can't. They, everything they're doing is great. It's all mad. It's all, all fantastic. All fantastic. The other big thing going on, um, and I'm going to go out on a limb right now and say it. ZSJ is going to win the G1. He's not. I, they broke the whole Gaijin at Wrestle Kingdom thing uh, last year with Jay White being in the main event. Um, I, he, he beat Naito, in fact, took Naito out, um, and then beat Shingo. I, I, tell me who's going to win if, he, if not him. I, I just don't think that they're they're going to push CSJ that far. I would love their I would love for them to, and I, I mean I guess I shouldn't say like it's I shouldn't be like hundred percent sure that it's not because fucking you know evil we never would have expected to be the world champion. He won the world championship last year, but but you know but you know the the thing is that I, I look at it and I'm like he's you know he's already he's already like in a prominent spot as being part of Dangerous Tech Cruise. He's already a world tag team champion. You know they they they've they tended to keep putting those, those belts on that team, kind of the way they were doing GOD before. So I, I kind of I kind of feel like they're gonna you know he's gonna be having a prominent spot at Wrestle Kingdom, but it's gonna be as the World Heavyweight Tag Team Champion or challenging for the World Heavyweight Tag Team Championship. So I mean when I when I look at but when I look at the field, I think we talked about this before. Like I'm looking at it, I I don't I do think there's a, that it's possible that the guy is gonna be in there, but I think my guess would be it's gonna be Jeff Cobb. It's see, Jeff, I look, Jeff, see, I look at it, it's either, it's either going to be Kazushka Okada or it's going to be Jeff Cobb. And the way I'm looking at it is that um, ZSJ has all the credentials that we that they gave to Sonata um, a few years ago when we were thinking Sonata should have gotten that big push. Um, ZSJ has all those credentials and what he has that Sonata didn't is some kind of in-ring charisma where sonata is a great wrestler but he didn't have that it factor um zsj does i think that's the biggest biggest difference between the two but you know they tried it with sonata he just didn't catch on but they've got zsj has all the same credentials that sonata had at that time during that run so i could definitely see and now he's got a win over the current champion well the interim champion well the I don't know. The fake champion? Is that what Osprey called him? 
I think yeah, I think you ought to think him. You know when I when I, you know when I but see I look at like what's coming up for Wrestle Kingdom and it's gonna be three nights this year, which is just insane, but it is. Right. So so I so I kind of look at it like they took you know they took the they took the junior heavyweight championship off of Desperado, which was a fucking stupid move. Um because you know they because they, they had this thing where they were building up or like last year last year I shouldn't say it was a stupid move, but it's stupid for if they, if they were doing what Takahashi wanted to do last year, right? Where Takahashi was like, I want to meet event in Tokyo Dome as a junior heavyweight champion. Well, the, right. the, the way that would have worked is if Desperado kept on as a junior heavyweight champion and Takahashi was, was coming back to challenge him for that championship, right? Two, two, two people colliding on those paths. Um, right. That's not going to happen anymore because now the title is not is no longer on El Desperado. Um, yeah, it's on Robbie Eagles. It's on Robbie that... Eagles. Yep. Okay, that's yeah, that's, yeah, uh... yeah, yeah. Eagles, Eagles beat Desperado for it. Then he did. Then he beat Takahashi in the he he, he beat Hiromu in the in the challenge when Hiromu challenged him for it. So okay. Um. So and and but actually now coming up, I I don't know when because got G1 going on right now, but um, El Desperado is actually going, going, to, going to be facing Robbie Eagles title for title. So Desperado's, Desperado's putting the junior heavyweight tag team titles on the line against Robbie Eagles junior heavyweight championship. <laughs> yeah, so, but but so any, but my, my, my has no say in it then? Uh, what's that? Kanemura? So he has no say in whether they keep the championships or not? Apparently not. <laughs> All right, whatever. But so so I'm so I'm looking at that and saying, okay, well you've already kind of screwed up this junior heavyweight championship thing, um, in, in my opinion. Um, so you've got to have something else going on for those two nights of Wrestle Kingdom to build to the third night of Wrestle Kingdom, right? So the way I'm looking at it is we've already, you know, Okada was already challenged by Will Osprey. So, you know, Osprey wants to defend his real World Heavyweight Championship against Okada. And then we've got Shingo, who's, got, who's going to need a challenger for his title. And Jeff Cobb, in the rematch from last year's, his past year's Wrestle Kingdom, would make a hell of a lot of sense in that spot. And then, and then we, and then, you, know, it, you know, assuming that Osprey defends against Okada and Shingo defends successfully against Cobb, then we've got that that big unification match then at the third end of Russell. I, I can see them having a um, G1 in the U.S. Uh, and having the um, winner of the G1 in the U.S. against Osprey on night one, the winner of the G1 in Japan against Shingo on night two, and then Osprey and Shingo on night three for the unification of it. It's September twenty fifth right now. If they're going to be going, if they're going to be doing a G one in the U.S., better announce it pretty fucking soon. They did it last year, like in no time. They they put it together no, no, immediately. No they, no, they did a new Japan Cup in the U.S. last year. There's a difference. That Kenta won for the U.S. to face the U.S. champion. Right. That was that was a new Japan Cup, which is only one match. Okay, maybe around. they're going to end up. Do, maybe they'll do something like that then. I don't know. But the way Japan does things is they, they figure out their number one contenders by tournaments and by who uh, gets a pinfall in those tournaments. So either way, ZSJ is going to get a title shot because he yes. pinned the champion. So right. whether he wins the G1 or he, um, or he doesn't, he's still going to get a title shot in the next few months. Yeah. I just don't think, but I, I just don't think he's going to win the G1 as much as I would love for him to. You know, I I think I think he he's he's where White was two years ago. It's just time. It's time. You got to strike while they're hot. Um, I feel bad for Adam Page because I feel like he's cooled off a little bit now since he hasn't been on TV. I'm hoping when he comes back, they're able to get that fire going right away. But the story isn't looking so much like it's going to be Kenny versus um, uh, Page at. Um, full gear, like we were originally thinking. Because no, full, full that, gear that, is in what a it, month. And that really surprises me because it's it's in a, a month and a half. Um, but that that really surprises me because the the 
dynamite after full gear is in hangman's home state you know so yeah. so i so, so i i felt you know but but you know he's got to come back soon if that's gonna happen right he's got to come back soon. he's got to come back this week if they're gonna if they're gonna get an event because right now everything is about uh brian danielson facing omega at full gear to redo what they just did yeah well within the last within the next couple of weeks anyway. but yeah i mean he needs to come back i would say with at least with a month to go um full gears on november 13th so right you know, and that's in minnesota that's in at target center right they had to move it it's november 13th that's the rumor hasn't been hasn't been officially announced yet but but uh the but Definitely, for sure, Rampage the night before is in Target Center. Yeah, I'd heard that they were that they were they moved it to Target Center. I thought I saw it was confirmed. I I could be wrong. Well, if you look at the AEW Kicks website, it says to be determined. Oh, okay. So A, so AEW has not confirmed it, although like a lot of different media sources are reporting. Okay. Um, All right. Yeah, and you know that, and and you know, being that we're in Minnesota, I was looking at ticket prices for Rampage, and you know, I looked at ticket prices for Dynamite, a couple, you know, in a couple of different locations, and like front row seats were going for like ninety five dollars. At Target Center, they were going for like four hundred and fifty for Rampage. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> Probably because it's a live Rampage that doesn't happen now because they tape at the same time they are. You know, they tape it right after Dynamite, um, and it's also a uh, um, a go home show. No, but I was looking at Dynamite to do $95 for tickets. Not, not Rampages, I was looking at Dynamite to so $95 for Rampage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like, what the fuck? Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, it's, it's one of those things that I don't know. I don't know if it's because they use AXS and AXS is a bunch of assholes or you know what. Because the, but... the other places use different assholes, you know? Anyway, I don't know, but as far as you know, like the G1, I've only watched those three matches. I've had no interest in anything on the A block. Um, <laughs> ZSJ and Naito, ZSJ and Shingo, Shingo and Ishii were the three matches I watched, and all three of them were fantastic. I thought, I thought ZSJ versus Naito was much better than the a critically acclaimed Shingo versus Ishii. Um, yeah. And then last, the one I watched yesterday with Shingo and ZSJ, that was just gold. That match was fantastic. You know, I, I wonder, you know, I, and I actually wondered a little, a little bit um, this morning, I think it was about, I wonder if people who watched that with Japanese commentary would have appreciated it as much as we appreciated it watching it with American commentary. Because, you know, because with American commentary, you know, they were referencing back of, you know, um, you know, the last time that they had wrestled each other and how Shingo had, had beat him with a rear naked choke. And so, yeah. and so, you know, Shingo was kind of focusing on the same thing, you know, focusing on the neck, you know, trying for the rear naked choke, trying for the sleeper, things like that to knock, to try to get him to tap. Instead of, he only went for the last dragon, like the last couple of minutes of the match. You know, I mean, really, really, he was going for the, the neck for the most part of the match against, against CSJ. And I, and I thought, you know the that story was was so great with you know with uh the, with the arm of Shingo versus the neck of ZSJ and you know just everything that, that ZSJ was doing to that arm and you know and Shingo's of course you know his usual just driving forward attack but this time focusing on the neck of of ZSJ it was just, it was just such a great great match I really enjoyed it and then see, yeah. and, see and, and and you don't and you don't ever you know we have never seen. In an AEW ring, Shingo get to the point where his spirit was broken, because that's what happened at the end of that match. You know, ZSJ, yeah. you know, he, he had him, he had him locked in that in that um kind of like triangle arm submission, and three times Shingo tried to power out of it, couldn't do it, and eventually he just tapped out because he just couldn't he couldn't escape. You know. Yeah, and we, tapping and the heavyweight and, champion. And you know, even against the match against Ishii, you mentioned the match against Cobb. You know, he's never, we've never seen a spirit get broke. No. <laughs> but but you know, and, did that too. And he tapped, he tapped the champion. Yeah. You know, that's, that's just, that's huge. That's huge. Um, I, 
that's kind of why I'm behind ZSJ right now to win the G1 is because that was such a huge moment. And you and I argued about it before about how in wrestling moments mean a lot more to you than they do to me. But that was that was a huge star making moment for a guy who was already a superstar. Yeah, the, and the other thing to look at with ZSJ is coming into this tournament, he had nine submission wins in the G1. Now he's got now, yeah, after, now, now, after, now after two matches this year, he has 11. So. <laughs> yeah, and isn't aren't they calling him the submission specialist now? Well, they always have. No, but it, it was some. It was more prominent this this time in his entrance video and everything than I've ever seen before. I mean, the man and I, one thing that they did talk about that um, not Kevin Kelly, his counterpart Chris Sampson, is it? Charlton. No, it's not Chris Sampson. Chris Charlton. Chris Charlton. Talk that talked about about his six second rule. Yep. Where if you can't make a guy tap in six seconds, move to a new move. Um, having Chris explain that to me, now I'm watching ZSJ matches and going, oh, that's why he gave that up so quickly. Because you, you, I'm so used to seeing um, wrestlers, once they lock in a submission move, it's there. They just leave it there until the guy taps. And it could be 10, 15, 20 seconds. Um, and I never understood that about ZSJ, about how he's constantly um, switching. But it was nice that Chris explained that because it makes a whole lot more sense now. It, it, it does. And did, did, I know you're. I know you don't often watch the kind of aftermaths of matches in New Japan. Did you turn it off right after the match? Or did you keep watching for a few minutes? I kept watching. I kept right, so watching. you say. So, so you heard him say. So I. So you probably heard him say, say, something, say something like, "Well, I, I just, I just, you know, crushed the spirit of the of the Japanese dragon, the type yep. of the American dragon. Where, where's he, where, Where's that fucker at? You know. Yeah. So uh, that's a match <laughs> I want to see. <laughs> As soon as he as soon as he said that, that was I was like, oh yes, make that happen, Tony, make that happen, because I want to see those two together. Yeah, absolutely. The it, it, it uh, um, I it just it's just fantastic. I I'm just so in love with yeah. wrestling right now. And then I mean, yeah, and then, yeah, it's too yeah, it's too bad. It's too bad. New Japan has a show the same night as um as Full Gear because you know having. That'd be a great match for Dan to full year also would be against CSJ. Yeah, that's too bad because that would have been a good way for, you know, bring back Paige, get him some heat with Omega, stir up that heat again with Omega to get that full gear and then have Danielson wrestle CSJ on that card would be perfect. Yeah. That'd be exactly. a perfect, perfect thing. And CSJ, I mean, we saw what he did with Jonathan Gresham in 15 minutes um, two years ago, two, three years ago. I just, I, my mouth is watering with, at the anticipation of seeing Danielson and uh, ZSJ together in the ring. Speaking of Gresham, did you, did you watch Gresham versus Suzuki from that? Yeah, I, I, I was just going to, I was just going to try, uh, you know, roll into GCW in the highest in the room. Um, it was a weird mix of styles, wasn't it? It was, it, but it, it, still, it was still, it was still awesome. It worked. Yeah, it yeah. worked. Whatever it was, it worked. It was, it, Kind of like, it, and it wasn't, it didn't feel like the CM Punk um, powerhouse Hobbs where they just had that just misstep with chemistry. They seem to have a lot of chemistry um, and they, they put on a hell of a match considering the difference in styles. And I really love the fact that Gresham kept trying to push his foundation thing with the handshakes and Suzuki just kicked him away. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was great. Really liked it. Yeah. The, the, the yeah, Suzuki. Uh, <laughs> I, I enjoy Suzuki so much more outside of New Japan than I enjoy New Japan. You know, right. Because he because because he's not like running around with cables choking people out and that kind of bull, you know that kind of bullshit. He's actually well, you know, he's he going to on October twenty third. He, he, he might use a chair here or there, but I mean it's more you know where he's actually you know wrestling matches, and I, I really enjoy that you know, that 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 fighting aspect of him. I can't wait to see him in that death match against uh, Nick Gage on October 23rd. Yeah. We, guys, there's a, there's a couple of big shows coming up with GCW. Um, I mean, they're, they're, I, I did not buy the show. For the you know, that's, that's one thing you like, Jeff. You're like, you're like, you're, 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 you're second for the promotion right now. And I really enjoy what they're doing. But at the same time, I can't afford to spend, you know, to buy their pay-per-views every single week. So, no, yeah, um, exactly. It's, it's, only, it's, it's only when they've got like a really 
really super looking show that I'm going to buy them. And October 9th, we've got the death match for the GCW World Championship between Nick Gage and uh, John Moxley. Two weeks after that, we get we've got um, Mo- we got a, again Nick Gage this time against Minoru Suzuki. So another and another death. I, match. So awesome. I kind of wish that I kind of wish that Mox would actually bring that GCW World Title to the ring on Dynamite. I yeah. kind of like I, Christian Cage does with impact with the impact, um, and Kenny did what it does with the Triple A and he did with the impact and all that. Uh, but it is nice and, and, to be wearing and, and, GCW and, 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 gear. And the Good Brothers with the, with the Impact World Champion, Tag Team Champion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I kind of, kind of wish Mox would bring that to the ring, um, but he, he's at least wearing GCW gear on the way to the ring. So, right, and um, yeah, you know, the, the when, when's the last time you saw a celebrity match that as well as what you saw at High School? Also, you know, what I mean, I never. Mean, I, mean, I mean, maybe this, Stephen this, Amell. This, I was gonna say the Stephen Bell versus Brian Daniels or uh, Christian, Christopher Daniels match was was awesome, you know. But but I, I thought this one just like played into so many great wrestling tropes, and you know we we got some we got some involvement from you know a, a fairly popular wrestler these days on the independent circuit of Ring of Honor, right? And right. and you know and you know we, we got some other stuff, and actually Ali was involved in that as well. I mean there was there were so many things that like really played into that match with Ron Punches versus Tony Depp, and I really was entertained throughout. Yeah, I, I was too. And the one thing that uh, I really need to point out is um, when a guy who is a paid actor, um, like who, I can't remember the guy's name that, that came and turned on Funches, uh, Josh something. Paul Scheer. Paul Scheer. Paul Scheer. Yeah. I mean, he's a legitimate actor. Right. And he couldn't act for shit when, uh, when Ali Ketch came out with that knife. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was I was watching that going this is the worst acting I've ever seen in my life and it's by a real actor yeah but, you know and, and, then, and you know when I, when I was at the GCW show Allie was you know Allie kind of like walked right by me like with, with her ring gear on you know, you know the, the like the you know the black you know right. altar top and the black you know like you know short kind of like panty leg tights and yeah. you know like you know, like you know I you know, and I was and I was thinking like I should say something to her, but I also like you know they also like mentioned like before the show like you know she's kind of she's kind of taking a pull of knife on you like well maybe I'm a little scared to talk to her, you know. That's <laughs> right. the interaction like pull a knife. I was like, yeah, I'm kind of glad I mean, I didn't say anything. <laughs> right, yeah, they, and, and that was a very entertaining match, and you know Tony Deppen getting the win I felt was great because normally in a match like that it's always the actor that gets the win. So it was yeah. nice to see Tony get it. Um, Tony is just Tony is the MJF of GCW. Just everybody hates him. Yeah, he's an asshole. Right. Yeah, he is. He's great yeah. at what he does, but he just you know, he is he is easily the MJF of GCW. And the, and the one thing that he has over MJF is he's got re- he's got resting asshole. You know. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You know MJF kind of MJF like you know you know we. Um, I don't know if you watched that. Do you watch that Britt Baker thing about where she was having like a like a super fan come in and and was like introducing him, introducing her to people and gave her like a front row seat and stuff like that? No, I didn't. Well, because that was like the that was like the one thing that kind of like disappointed me a little bit was like MGF was like you know shaking her hand and like saying it's nice to meet her and stuff like that. Where as everything else I've ever seen is like he's been like completely in character all the time. You know? Yeah, I, like on Twitter every time. Did you see yeah. the post? Did you see the post that his mom posted? They no, were at that? the they were at uh, Grand Slam on Wednesday, and okay. she post uh, she made a sign that said we're MJF's parents and we don't like him either. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And you know they interviewed her and uh, for some wrestling podcast or wrestling show or whatever, but um, that that's fantastic. And I mean that calls back to remember when Excalibur said um, even MJF's parents are indifferent to him. Yeah, he said that. He said that like what six seven months ago, eight months ago, or something like that. And um, to see here to see his mom and dad in the crowd with that sign was fantastic. No, I I missed that. I mean that I the sign that I saw like you know really on there it was like just like, like, like giant macho man that would pop up very so often in the front oh, you know, yeah. on the hard cameras the hard i camera didn't i on. didn't see it on the 
I didn't see it on the TV. It was on uh, Twitter. It was retweeted by um, by AEW. Oh, okay. Following AEW, so now I'm following MJF's mom too because that's just fantastic. Mrs. Friedman. Huh? Yeah, yeah. I can't remember what her name is, but yeah. Um, yeah, it's just it's just great. Um, the other thing about GCW that there were two other matches on that show that I really enjoyed. Um, you know, Big Breast. Big Breakfast versus Andy Zane. Alex. Al is it yeah, Alex Zane or Andy? Yeah, Alex Zane. Alex Zane. How, what, why did the WWE not know what they had with him? You know, I was He's thinking phenomenal. the same thing. Like, you know, I look at that match and I watched him against, um, against Big Breakfast and I'm like, no. Okay, so if you, even if you didn't think you could do anything with this guy, why did you not at least do a program against um, Seth Rollins? Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, I looked at that, I'm like, like he, he and Seth Rollins could have actually like, absolutely torn down the house. You know? Exactly, yeah. And I mean, as speaking of Jordan Oliver, too, though, he just continues to impress. Every time I see him in the ring, he, he's better. Every single time, and I love I love watching what he's doing at GCW. I can't wait to start watching MLW again to see uh, see what he's going to be doing there. He's just over the last ever since I saw that cage or that Iron Man match between him and Deppin. I've just every time I see him, he's better, better and better every single time. I don't, uh, and you know, I don't know if you, uh, I don't know if you're ever planning on watching the Tortoise Hunter or not, Jeff, but. Um, the the Honor Rumble. Alex Zane was actually the 16th man in the Honor Rumble this year. You know they'd and, mentioned and, that, and, and he won it. So we're so we're getting we're getting um, so we'll be we'll be getting at some point Alex Zane versus Bandito for the world championship. Bandito is still the champion. He is, and they did they actually did a really nice job in that little four way. Building, you know, making him look like a strong kid. So okay, I, I'm planning on watching Death Before Dishonor, but like I said, right now it's probably fifth on my list. So it's not, you know, not top priority. Um, yeah. And I'm getting exposure to my Ring of Honor uh, favorites by watching all these other shows anyway. Um, the only one I, I haven't seen that I, I really want to is Brian Johnson. Well, and Shane Taylor. I haven't seen Shane Taylor, but. Other than that, I yeah, it, it's uh, I, I'm not going to tell you how, but the forbidden door got open. The forbidden door got opened again on Rampage, and so I'm really hoping we're going to get the super quick against STP on Rampage. It did. It did. Yeah. So must in this last half hour, a Ring of Honor talent appears on Rampage. In the last half. Yes. Finally. Finally. Yeah. Ring yeah. of Honor has been the one promotion missing from this love fest um, that's going on everywhere. They're the one thing that has been missing, and they're suffering because of it. So hopefully, yeah, and and, and you know, uh, and I was and I was I was kind of wondering about if that was going to happen. Not not this particular talent, just be, but just be, just uh, the door was going to open because you know we, we on other Ring of Honor broadcasts, both pay per view and TV, they would say things like. Um, you know, Angelina Love has been a world champion in other promotions, or in, or uh, or uh, um, EC3 has been a world champion in other promotions, right? Or, or in another promotion. On Death Before Dishonor, they actually called EC3 a former Impact World Champion, and nice. and they also they were they were congratulating Lee Moriarty on signing with AEW. So they were actually mentioning the names of those two promotions for the first time ever on their program, nice. which made, kind of which kind of made me think, well, maybe the maybe that you know maybe that frosty relationship that they, you know, because basically what happened was Ring of Honor kind of got butt through without you know everybody leaving to join AEW. You know, like you know they right. you know basically you know they lost the elite, they lost um, SCU, uh, SCU, best yeah, friends. Yeah, so no, I mean, they lost for Japan. 
They were, but they were appearing a lot for AEW. Or, I mean, a lot for Ring of Honor. You know, and so, I mean, basically, they lost like 10 of their, 10 of their like, most, like, most prominent. Yeah, they literally lost, in, in one, they literally one, lost their, half their roster because they, it took them about a year to become good again. Right. So, I mean, so I, I understand that, you know, so, but it, it does seem like maybe that frost is thawing a little bit. And I, and I hope that's true because I really think, like, Shea Taylor Promotions gets a super quick would be a fantastic match to, for, for us to finally get. You know, for, I shouldn't say finally, but for us to get because, you know, STP is, you know, the best six man tag in the world. So, I mean, if, if we could get that match and also like STP against um, the, you know, the, the longest reigning NJPW six man champions, that'd be fantastic as I'm, well. I'm a little surprised that, um, the Forbidden Door started with Impact and AEW. Right. Um, and Impact just, they don't really have any programs going on right now, except their, you know, their champion is, their tag team champions are part of the elite and their champion is part of, uh, is part of AEW. So, yeah, I, that, yeah I, I was really hoping we'd we see a title switch at Victory Road. You know, it, you know, it's it's it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me to keep having an Impact World Champ, you know, your Impact World Champion be an AEW wrestler. No, because because now because I mean we're we're getting to the point where when it once it gets to um, Bound for Glory, which is coming up like the middle of next month, it'll be it'll be a full six months now that a AEW talent has been your Impact World Champion. They still look at Christian though as an impact talent. Since but he's, he's not signed. The... But he's not. But he's not signed. I know. No, I I know. I get that. But it, it's he's not. He's not the invading guy like Kenny Omega was. He's actually looked at as a, an impact person when you watch Impact. Um, I just wish there was a little more crossover with the people on Impact. Like if Christian's um, going to be getting in a title fight against uh, whoever. I don't know who the, who his next opponent is, but why not have his next opponent run into an AEW ring and beat him up after a match or something? I don't. Well, well he's still in a program. Anything. He's, he's, still in a, he's still in a program against Ace Austin right now, so you know I I don't know if they're if they're going to like you know, have a rematch at Bound for Glory. I, I kind of doubt it, but it, it, that'd be kind of awesome if Ace Austin finally, you know, does does get that does get that rematch and, and wins the championship from. Christian Cage, but you know the the thing, and, and I think I also saw kind of like a thing like you know uh, with Josh Alexander staring down Christian too, like kind of like title for title, thing. right? Interesting, mm-hmm. or at least champion versus champion thing. But my my point is not that you don't think Christian as as an impact talent, at least you know that baby management does. But you know, as an impact wrestler, would you rather have like an impact wrestler right. be your champion? Exactly, exactly. But I just I think that you know NJPW ever since Kenta showed up on on Dynamite, um, NJPW has been prominent on Dynamite and Impact and um, you know and GCW. Uh, you know it seems like Impact really hasn't been a part of it um, lately. They're, I mean, it's just their championship show up on Dynamite, but there's no crossover stories. Right. That's true. Yeah, I, I don't know why they're doing it. That but it's nice to see Ring of Honor finally throw their hat in the ring and be a part of this, too. Finally. Because that that was the one thing that was really hurting them was the fact that they weren't a part of all this. And, ML, and I'm loving the... It's not just... Um, the three big ones, you know, Ring of Honor or four big ones, New Japan, Dynamite, Impact, and Ring of Honor. It's also GCW, which is becoming a big part of this Forbidden Door thing too, which I'm really enjoying, uh, especially because when was the last time you looked at a um, a wrestler that was signed by a major promotion but was working in independent on the independent circuit? Maybe yeah. back Samoa Joe and um, AJ when they were originally with Impact, but they were still working with Ring of Honor. Well, AJ also like yeah. wrestled some independent things in his last like month or so with TNA, right? 
Yeah. But yeah. he was already out the door that, at that point. And then well, he, he, went already, solely he, might, into he might have already been out the door, but he, but he wasn't. His contract was not up. Yeah, and then he went to the independent scene. But I mean, seeing I look at look at the guys that we've seen on GCW over the last month. We had Mox, Matt Cardona, um, uh, Minoru Suzuki, Jonathan Gresham. Just there was the MLW else was there. The, the MLW World Champion was on highest. Oh yeah, Jacob Fatu. That was the one I was missing. Um, yeah. That was the one I was forgetting. You know so. It's just, and now with MLW being involved, it's, oh my God, I'm just, I feel like I have to watch all the shows because you never know who's going to show up where. Did you feel like a little bit, speaking of Jacob Purdue, did you feel like a little bit sick to your stomach watching the Dirty Daddy kick out of that insult? I mean, it's been so protective. And yeah. And Chris Dickinson kicks out of it. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't overly impressed with that. Um, I also... Yeah. That was another instance where it's like, why didn't why didn't he wear the belt, his MLW belt to the ring? Why didn't he use his Contra music? Like I was waiting to hear "Hail Contra." Um, Wait, well, didn't he, he didn't wear his Contra ring gear? Either. Yeah, he was. He, was, just, he, was, he wore he wore like kind of like a green, like kind of like tie dye tie dye. You know, yeah, like, it yeah. wasn't. It was not had nothing to do. With, I but I was expecting, um, you know, to be a true crossover with him and his Contra music and the MLW um, title around his waist and all this stuff. And it just wasn't. Well, MLW hasn't run shows in such a long time. Maybe, maybe they, maybe they still got the belt. You didn't have, you didn't have access to the belt. <laughs> Possibly. Possible. I, guess I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, it's not like they're like a really a touring brand where they do house shows. You know, they, they'll, they'll do like a show, like every, I mean, they, even when they were running, Regularly, they would do like, basically like a show and keep like you know four episodes at a time. So it may be one of those things where the, where the belt just stays with promotion. He just show, he just shows up. Yeah, possibly, possibly. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to think, anything else that we haven't covered? <sighs> um, show breaking my heart. Joining Bullet Club. <laughs> that's right that's right i i remember texting i remember like i am saying um that that show's gonna break your heart yeah i mean it was it was rough to see him i mean we've seen it coming for a while but it was just rough to see him beat down yo like that i kind of think they're gonna go the other way i really thought that yo would be the one to turn yo not sure i kind of thought so too that was where i was thinking um, but it was, it makes sense because show is the more talented of the two. Um, yeah, but he, but he was also the more popular of the two. So it, it kind of, to me, it made sense that, that you know, he'd be fighting from underneath. He'll be the, the heel having the bullet club tactics, you know? Yeah, true. True. I don't know. But yeah, that, um, was, that was kind of rough to watch. Well, we, we also did not mention um, that fantastic, I quit match between Yano and Chase Owens. I didn't watch it. Oh, wait, no, I did watch that. That was amazing. Watching uh, Yano be his GBH character again. Yeah. That was, I. if that kind of Yano comes out there, I'll be a Yano fan. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. And then, like, see, like seeing like uh, Chase get like frustrated because he, he can't get Yano to, uh, to give up to the straps, so he, he like walks away from the handcuffs to go get. Some, I think he went to go get a couple of chairs or something. And Yano has like the handcuffs taped. To his <laughs> well, and who was it? Was it uh, Charlton that said, "Of course he has the keys. He brought the handcuffs." Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, but I, I mean, I, I love that version of Yano. That was one of my favorite. Um, that might have been, I mean, his comedy stuff, depending on who he's doing it with, like his match last year against uh, um, Takahashi, where Takahashi sent him down the elevator to get the win. Um, you know, that was fun. He's had a few other fun matches, but Toro Yano has been 
such a ridiculous comedy character for so long, it's nice to see him return to his GBH roots. Yeah, and not a comedy, not a good comedy character like Brandon Cooper either. Just like just no, really irritating. Um, and and yeah, it was. I mean, and guys, if you haven't seen it, I mean, basically, you know, Chase Owens is like you know, bound and determined. He is not going to give up. You know, he's you know he's the Texas world. He's the Texas heavyweight champion. He's finally right. got the NJ, the NJ, or the uh, what's it called? K-O-P-W. The uh, K- KOPW provisional championship. You know, the first, the only one I ever put besides Giano. And he's, you know, he keeps yelling never every time there's another person making his face until Giano's literally going to stab his eye out. <laughs> so, yep. out. And he finally, he's like, give up, give up, give up. Because he has to. Otherwise, you know, he's going to lose an eye. So, right. yeah, I mean, that's, got, that's kind of Giano we have not seen. Well, ever since Jeff and I started watching, but I mean, in general, in, in pro wrestling for like, I don't know, eight years, nine years. So. Well, he, I mean, he became the comedy character when um, Nakamura left Chaos and Chaos kind of became face. When Chaos was heel, um, he was that character. But once they turned into a face group, he became the comedy character. Right. So we're talking 2013, 14. Okay, yeah, that wasn't sure the exact time frame, but I know it was before we started watching regularly. Yeah, yeah, and I mean he, and I, I mean he hit and miss with me, like like I said that match against Takahashi, um, and I don't know if that was because Takahashi does that that part so well too, but that was a fun match, um, you know, in the the match against um, oh, the first match against Chase Owens, I thought was was fun too um but man the strap the strap the strap match yeah i want yeah, this his, though go ahead. this is the toro yano i want going forward and i don't know was he this toro yano in in the g1 because i didn't watch that match i didn't either but uh, but no i i did, I did like see like the like the as they were like 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 uh going away apparently was it takahashi i think it might have been takahashi or Right, he was either talking about your kid who was against the first round, and like he had been like, I guess taped to the rail, and but then he like snuck out and like snuck up behind and got a roll, you know. So. Well, and it was it was funny too that because every time uh, Yoro has done or every time he has done the low blow, Kevin Kelly's monitors always goes out, and in that match it was the first time it didn't go out. He goes, I saw that my monitor didn't go out this time. Yeah, that, that was kind of so, fun. Yeah, that was that was fun too. Um, another thing that we didn't talk about that we really should, Kota Ibushi losing to Yujiro Takahashi. Oh, did he? Yeah, he lost to the um, C-level Bullet Club member. The defending two-time G1 winner lost to the C-team of the Bullet Club. Wait, does he even get that high of a ranking? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because I don't think there's anybody below him. Okay, that's what I meant. Is like, why does he get such a, why is he, why is he a C and not like a D? <laughs> well, because you kind of, you kind of look at G.O.D., G.O.D., Jay White, um, they're the A team. The B team is Chase Owens. Um, uh, I can't, can't remember his name. Big guy. Uh, he Yeah, but the other big guy. Um, oh, I haven't seen him for so long. I can't even think of his name. Yeah, the underboss. I can't think of his name either. Right yeah, now. you know that's kind of the B team, and then I would say that Takahashi would be the C team. Well, we're already evil at Kento. There must be on the. They're the B the... team. They're the B team. Are they? I mean, Evil's a former world champion, so I kind of have to put him on the A level too. I think. You think so? I mean, because. Up there with G.O.D. and Jay White? Yeah, because on any given day, he's going to be challenging for the World Championship. I suppose the same with Kenta. Kenta would probably be up in that A-team as well. Yeah, I think Kenta's kind of like on that border. I, think, I guess you can kind of say they're both on that border, but like Evil just Evil was just the most recent World Championship challenge, you know, so I don't know how you yeah, can not have enough. it on the A-level, you know? But yeah, I, I um, mean, Kota losing, Kota losing to him was... 
I, a weird step. Yeah, and then and then against Ishii, he didn't look that sharp either. Like against Ishii, I swear Ishii got like eighty five percent of the offense in, and Kota hit a standing. Um, fuck, what the hell is finishing? No. Um, anyway, he had this he had the standing knee strike, then he hit the ground knee strike, and he got the win. That was that was pretty much most of his offense, right? Aren't they calling it the Golden Trigger? No, it's that was that I was. I thought they kept that name with, with Ken. No, that was his. Yeah, but I thought. Kenny. I know, but I thought he kept that name when um, Kenny left. I thought no, he kept he it as not. his finisher. He, it's his still his finisher, thing, but it's not the stand the name of the move. I'm sorry, go ahead. The other thing, and while you're looking that up, the other thing that we really need to talk about, because we said, like, I already referenced it. I already Kamigoye. referenced it Kamigoye. once. Kamigoye. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, okay. I already referenced it once, um, and... We were going to talk about it later, but how much fun was that Effie versus Scorpio match in the highest of the room? It was just, that was just from start to finish, their little dance off or whatever they were doing in the beginning. Um, and then, you know, the stuff during the match itself, just everything about it was great. I really enjoyed Scorpio the couple matches I've seen him back in GCW. There was the one against uh, Effie, like you just said, and then the one the other one was. Fuck, who was he against before? I mean, I can, my, my, it was somebody that I've never seen wrestle before, but that was funny as hell where, oh, the Grim Reefer, that's what it was, the Grim Reefer, where, okay. like, you know, they're, they're, like, passing a joint around in the crowd, and then, you know, the Reefer, you know, the Reefer, um, the Reefer, like, goes to give, he goes to give Scorpio, um, like, say to the blunt, and Scorpio goes to, goes to, you know, he, like, lifts up his mask to, like, take a hit, and, and Reefer like kicks him in the gut, and then um, um, Reefer's like puts the Reefer in, and, he's, and then he gets Scorpio in a headlock. Instead of like trying to kick out of the headlock, Scorpio just reaches up and grabs Reefer and not throws it across the ring. So Reefer will let go, go, get the, go get the. That's funny. <laughs> the <blood. laughs> that's funny. Yeah. yeah, he's, and that's the way comedy matches should be. You yeah. know, comedy character and comedy match should be is still a damn decent wrestler. But being able to poke fun at things, um, and I wouldn't necessarily call Effie a comedy wrestler, but the match that he had that that was just entertaining. It was just entertaining and fun, um, except yeah. for that you know thirty seconds. I thought Effie was dead. Yeah, you take out that yeah. little bit, you take out that little bit, and that match was just fun. And it's free on Fight now, isn't it? It's free for or us. I bought it. Oh, you did? Okay, I didn't know you bought it. I, <laughs> I went and logged on. I'm like, this must be free. Um, so they don't they do not do anything free on there, huh? No. No. It's just like $50 a show or something. Kind of, yeah, that's just... Kind of, kind of like the way TNA used to be. They, they have to have they have to make money somehow. Yeah, I suppose. Because they're probably not making a ton off the gate. And it, no, I mean it's not, it's, always, it's not like they have a, a network TV deal. I mean, I mean, maybe they would get some money if they signed up to be like, you know, we're part of you know fight, you know, fight plus or something, or they they had a deal like uh, NWA Power does. But right, they're getting. But but you know, I I don't know. I mean, I I think that their their business model seems to work fine. You know. Yeah, I mean, they're able to afford big name talent. I can't imagine Moxley went in there for twenty five bucks. No. <laughs> yeah. No, I can't either. So they're obviously it's obviously working. They're obviously getting the buys and things. Yeah, you can you can kind of imagine if Moxley like told Renee like you know I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go you know wrestle in a cage for a hundred bucks in a death match. You're like what? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I just I can't see that happening. Yeah. No. Um, so yeah, but there's a lot of and I wish there was a way to watch GCW for free. Because I would like to, I would like to turn people onto it, get people turned onto it, and because um, I think that's it's just a, another great promotion. Well, they actually last Saturday they actually did have a free show. Um, they? So they, they, you know, last Saturday like I bought highest in the room, but the next day they had a like cross promotional match on their YouTube channel, or cross oh, promotional show on their YouTube channel. For, like, that's probably like a two or three hour show too. They do, and they, they do they, and they do eventually like put some of their big shows. On their YouTube channel for free, but you, but if you're but you're not going to be able to see like, you know, most of their live shows are not going to be on YouTube, or like if you right. get like, 
or like if you sign, sign up to uh, IWTV.com, um, they've got like 35 or something DCW shows on there. And that's like a $10 a month wrestling streaming service that has like thousands and thousands of hours of pro wrestling from all kinds of different wrestlers on. You know, it's just not, cool. it's just not something I've signed up for because like, where the fuck do I have time to watch something besides what I'm watching? I barely know? have time to watch what I watch now. Right, exactly. Um, you know, I, I would love to be able to sit down and watch the entire G1, but with Dynamite and, uh, you know, with AEW and then, you know, it, it, it's AEW I don't want to miss a second of. And I haven't felt that way about any wrestling company in years. years. Well, I'll miss time for Dark and Elevation, but for, for, for their big shows or big national TV shows, those ones I'm going to not miss. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying, is I, I don't want to miss a second of their televised shows. Uh, their YouTube and we, shows. And we, and, we have a, and we have another hour of network television for them starting the next Wednesday. You know? What's with, that? With uh, the roast, that roast of the pop show. It's starting on Wednesday. Oh, like I'm gonna watch that shit. I'm going to. I I don't know that I'm really into a reality TV show. Well, it's got Cody and Brandy as the main stars, but different wrestlers are gonna pop up every week. Like like, you know, we've seen we've, always, we've seen Ricky Starks on there. We've seen it, it'll give it, it'll give us a chance to like see, you know, other some of their talents like kind of behind the scenes and how they are like, well, quote unquote, real life, right? Because we are, didn't. Most reality shows are kind of scripted. Anyway. How did we miss talking about that? Malachi Black versus Cody Rhodes. <laughs> oh my God! The, the, the crowd was not into Cody at all on that show. No, and he he didn't like. You got to give credit to The Rock, um, at because his match against Hogan, when they came out and booed The Rock and cheered Hogan. The Rock, even though he was the babyface, played the heel during that match. Cody got booed mercilessly, and he stayed the babyface the whole match. And did you see that moment where he was just in utter shock? Like, yeah. He looked, looked around like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you've got a guy who's NWO cool. You've got a versus a guy who never loses a feud, who people have been us especially have been saying he's been a heel for the last two years um and who is seen as a guy who's using his position in the company to to further his own career against a guy who is nwo cool that everybody loves they've got mistreated by his former company so right. it's not people surprising really, yeah people really wanted to cheer um Alistair Black in WWE. They they wanted yep. to get behind him, and every time he this and every time he started getting momentum, they pulled him off TV. Yep. You know, and and now he's getting a platform on AEW where he's not being like you said, he's not being overexposed. But he's going out there, and he's got this amazing fucking entrance, right? And he's yep. got this incredible character, the Dark Messenger. You know, Malachi Black. You know, Black is dark, and Malachi means messenger. So. Dark Messenger, and he's going out there and he's having these outstanding matches, even against, you know, a guy who's only had four matches before him in Brock right. Anderson, and he's having these incredible matches against Lee Johnson, and he and he's going against and Dustin and, and Cody and, and, and Dustin and Cody exactly. So I, I I don't know how you can possibly cheer, you know, possibly boo Malachi Black, but you know, not at this point. You know. And I think. As much as I love the work that Cody's done, um, I feel like there was a there was a time when Cody was one of the top five six wrestlers on the planet. Um, I still think storytelling wise, he is character wise, it just doesn't fit him. His, his, him being a baby face only fits him because he's one of the faces of the company. Him being a baby face mixed with his character doesn't really fit because like you said his character never loses a feud he's not lost one feud in AEW. no i saw a perfect tweet the to to explain where cody is right now with his character and the crowd reactions and how people feel about him and that is you know he comes out of this he comes out of this red white and blue when he's wrestling mm -hmm. but he's not captain america he's homeland mm -hmm. He's Homelander. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. You know, the other thing, too, is 
he got a lot of flack and it doesn't you know, like i still don't understand why people are uh, actually thought anthony agogo was going to go over um on memorial day weekend against a guy calling himself the american dream and anthony ogogo is the foreigner i don't know why people thought he was going to win but the fact that he didn't win um is kind of where i saw the rest of the public turning on him like we've been calling him we've been saying he's he's a heel for years well for the last year and a half or so just yeah. because of his his tactics and everything um but i think that was when people really started to turn on him and then his feigning retirement um i think was a i don't think anybody bought into that angle at all um and it was just it, it, i i saw that it upset a lot of people because it was cody trying to make um that squash match that should have put it, uh, Malachi Black really over was trying to make the moment about himself. You know, there was yeah. a lot of. It was also so. It was also bizarre the week before with Rosaria Dawson jumping on the on the back of Malachi Black, and then not and explaining it, it. Well, no, they explained. They explained that he was like you know, that she was like his co-host on the on the Go Big Show, but um, that's what it's called, right? The Go Big Show. Um, anyway, I think um, so. But, but it's like, why, uh, why would Malachi just like throw her off? And shoot out, of you know that that's the part that didn't make make sense. I think, and then Cody like coming out of the crowd. Well, the crowd wasn't the crowd was booing Cody. They weren't cheering, you know. Yeah, they weren't when he was running. They were cheering Rosario Dawson, but once Cody got involved, they started booing him. Right. You know, it, yeah. it just. I think that moment that that not only the Anthony Agogo thing, but also the, um, his retirement thing really turned a lot of people on him. Yeah. And then, like I said, you've got him who never loses a feud. He made a, a superstar making moment for Malachi Black about himself. Um, you know, it, it, with all of that going on and then you've got super cool dude, uh, against him. Of course, he's going to get booed like that. Yeah, the Arn Anderson thing stuff was interesting. And Arn, and Arn was actually on Busted Open talking about that this week too. Where and it, and it sounds like they're really doing like a like where where Arn is Arn kind of said, well, he's too Hollywood now. You know, he, he's like he's Cody like Cody. Yeah, he, he goes he goes you know Cody could never coach me because he doesn't have the experience that I have. But I'm trying to coach him, and he doesn't want to listen because he's too Hollywood these days. So, so oh that really? Was, yeah. So that was so, interesting too. Arn Anderson went in character on Busted Open. Well, nice. He, he, the, the interview kind of started off with him being, him being out of character, like talking about like you know the backstage stuff and how how like how nice everybody is, how great you know Cody is to work with and stuff. And then, but then yeah, like they asked about Cody, he was like, yeah, Cody thinks Cody's just too Hollywood now. So that was that before this match or after? It was after this match because they were they were talking okay, about because. Because they, they were talking about how, like, you know, like, Arn, why did you get, why did you get up on the apron? He said, well, because I fell down. I quickly got out of the ring to get out of the ring to, uh, to to check on me, and I and I got up on the ring to tell him, don't you ever come down here and check on me? You know, you need to focus on what's going on in the ring. Well, it wasn't Cody like late, early last summer. Um, we kind of thought he was going to turn heel because he was having all kinds of issues with. Um, no, it was last winter. Where, because he was having issues not listening to Arn and being more aggressive and all this stuff, and that's when they decided to turn QT on him instead. Yeah, but they were kind of leading towards a Cody heel turn then. Seems like it. At least yeah. it felt. At least it felt like it. Right. Um, but it, you know, now if they're gonna ever turn Cody heel, now is the time. Because with that crowd reaction, um, and I don't doubt Tony Khan for a second. So if he turns him heel, great. If he doesn't, um, there's got to be a reason for it. But now, in my eyes, is the time you turn. It was basically a double turn that happened in that match, if you think about it. Well, the, the thing with Cody in this spot is not only does it feel like the right time to turn it heel, but also, but, but really, it also feels like he could be the he could be the face that this American top team thing needs, right? Where mm -hmm. where you know you you got you've got um, Dan Lambert out there as a spokesperson, but 
for really Scorpio Sky and Human Beings don't feel like the right fit for that stable to me. At least no. not yet. And and, I mean, and really and, and really what Lambert is doing is he's not only getting them over it all, he's getting himself over. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas whereas like Cody like looking like looking out the crowd going, you know, and probably thinking to himself internally, like, I've got twenty thousand one hundred and eighty nine people booing me. And I'm the one that created this fucking promotion. You know, I've been the face right. of this promotion. I'm the one that I'm the one, I was the spokesperson. I was the one I was one of the ones that brought this to you and you're booing me. Right. And joining and then, and then but then like not only turning heel, but also joining up with the guy that's talking about how bad the organization is and like saying stuff like, I'm gonna join up with American Top Team, we're gonna take down this goddamn promotion away from these people. Right. To me, to me would be the would be the perfect thing. Yeah, that's probably a good story for him too. Because I now, like I said, now I think though is the time to turn him heel. Um, yeah. Now that they, they'll capitalize on it, he hasn't been a heel since what his early Bullet Club days. Um, when he when uh, God turned on them and the Tongans all turned on, uh, all turned on the elite. Right, where it looked like, where it looked like, right, where it looked like Cody was going to be the one like turning turning against Kenny, but actually it was Jay White that pulled everything up from underneath both. Yeah. Right, yeah, and and that was when uh, Tama handed him the chair. Yeah, and he refused that he right. refused to hit Kenny instead. He hit Tama with it. Um, right, you know that that was when he turned face, and he hasn't been a heel since. Yeah, so that's been a little bit over three years. Yeah, so it's it's time for him to turn heel anyway. I did it with the box. We did it with. Uh, um, with Kenny, uh, it's time for Cody to turn heel too. Yeah, I just, I just, I just think that they should stay away from having Cody join the elite. He should be yeah, healed absolutely separately, separately. And you know, I, I would love to see Dustin and Lee Johnson turn heel with him. You know, they're done with the the Nightmare Factory, so they don't need to be a face faction anymore. Yeah, that'd be interesting. And if I, you I, think I, about I, it, I, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, like where you know how long the fact that speaking of that, the factory is going to be in limbo now because they're they're still waiting for Anthony Ogogo to recover from his eye surgery, right? So I mean, it's yeah, like, I don't and this is like his seventh or eighth eye surgery, and so it, it's you know because because I think like you know that's kind of the I think that was it should be like the end goal if you're going to keep using you know Paul White in this in this role is to have him lose to a go-go, right? Or a leader right. or Camarado, one of the two. Um, right. I think, I think those guys both have tremendous upside. But, you know, you got to do something to, to, that's that's like the one thing where like, to, you know, we saw Paul White take on Marshall at All Out, but we haven't really seen the factory at all since then. Well, if you, if you think about it, fa- uh, factions in wrestling are usually heels anyway. I mean, you've always got that one face faction that's in the in the company, but for the most part, if you're a faction, you're a heel. Um, and right now, the inner circle's the face faction. Well, on Dark Order, I guess they have they have three face factions right now: Dark Order, um, Inner Circle, and Nightmare Family. Turn night for Nightmare Family heel. Death Triangle. Yeah, Death Triangle too. Jesus. They have way too many face factions. <laughs> You're only supposed to have one, not six. Just guess I guess this try goes probably more like a tweeter faction. I mean, I mean the, I mean the, I mean the definitely the Lucha Brothers are feeding faces, but I can't really well, see Cactus. They're they were Death Triangle is kind of the Lij. They're that tweener faction that will just feud with anybody. Yeah, I kind of, they're kind of like uh, I, don't, I don't know if you. Well, you said you haven't seen it, but I'm going to search and see the uh, the trod for Brody King. When it comes out, it says, no heroes, no villains, just violence. Violence. Nice. <laughs> All right. Well, I've got nothing else to talk about. Um, I need to go watch MLW Alpha. I need to watch NJPW Strong. <laughs> and I need to finish Rampage. And we got Cry Macho to watch today, too. Oof, duh. Yeah, you, you was, we don't, we want to and my Google finally came up, and I just realized that uh, you sent me a couple of shows that I didn't even know I had in my email. Oh, lovely. I'll have to get those posted, too. 
Well, maybe we should just got, should we just stop? Do you, you want to still want to do a show tomorrow or? Uh, it's up to you. I mean, Cry Macho is Clint Eastwood. I haven't seen a good Clint Eastwood movie in probably five years, so I wouldn't mind watching it. Um, All right, know. let's 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 get that in today and watch that show tomorrow. All right, sounds good. All right, so guys, thanks so much for watching. Until next time, this is Shane saying Wild Days, Pleasant Nights, and Jeff saying goodbye.